Members, this is the appointed time and we have a quorum. So let's invite the witnesses in. Good morning, Secretary. Well, I don't won't go through the names of your team one by one. Today, uh, the committee will look into Audit Report Number Sixty Four, Chapter Two, Operation of the Government Flying Service, and uh, our. Fighter today would be uh, Mr. Ng Lang Singh, who will be in charge of um, Chapter 2. So, Mr. Ng Lang Singh, 15 minutes for you. And for other members, I'm sorry, Mr. Ng, you, you can have 20 minutes. Other members will have 10 minutes because we have a number of members who uh, will have to leave the, the room for other businesses and uh, will try to uh, work out uh, the. Uh, Arrangement. So, Secretary, are you going to read out uh, speaking notes? Well, just uh, a few words. All right, Chairman. Uh, um, the uh, GFS and uh, I thank the Audit uh, Audit Commission for their work on the Government Flying Service, with a lot of um, useful observations and recommendations. The government, in general, agrees with the recommendations and will actively follow up on them. On the provision of flying service, the department will strive to enhance the uh, target meeting ratio in the controller's report and will consider improving the re arrangements on the rec recording statistics and the disclosure of uh, uh, operational details for the public to understand better and assess the, the department's uh, actual working performance. On the management of air crew members, the GFS will consider how, within existing manpower resources, to better man manage the manning levels and manpower deployment to meet increasing servicing needs. On aircraft's maintenance, the GFS will continue to abide by the stringent uh, air, um, aviation laws and the professional standards to maintain and inspect aircraft to ensure safety and will review the relevant procedures to increase the number of available uh, serviceable aircrafts. On the procurement of aircrafts and parts, the department will enhance training and management and to um, instruct staff members to take, take better care in uh, procurement um, matters and will continue to monitor closely the uh, progress of procurement of fixed-wing aircrafts and helicopters. I'd like to point out uh, two observations. First, the report mentions some um, examples of not meeting the target and uh, some uh, situations of insufficient air crew members. It has to do with the um, manpower problem in the GFS. The GFS is one of the departments in the Hong Kong GAR government with the uh, smallest establishment. We have an establishment of 229, but actually uh, there are only 214 um, staff and a pilot grade because of na uh, natural uh, because of wastage. The actual number of pilots um, is 15 uh, is 16 percent short of the 44 in this establishment. However, they're required to maintain the operation of 11 um, aircrafts to provide around-the-clock emergency rescue service in Hong Kong and the South China Seas. And the call-in hours in the past years have increased by 25 percent, with the total flying hours increased to uh, by 18 percent. And with the loss of uh, wastage of some experience. Uh, pilots, we have uh, major constraints in operation and training. The department uh, in the past implemented various measures to s expedite the recruitment procedure to uh, fill the vacancies. And in the future, the administration, the GFS, will draw on a, rep on a draw reference from the audit report and make the best manage power management with the existing resources. And will also increase manpower to meet service needs and to ensure uh, staff safety. 
Secondly, safety is the major consideration in government flying service. We must ensure safety of the aircrafts or that it will be very diff uh, dangerous for um, uh, officers um, undertaking rescue operations in extreme flying attitudes or uh, extreme weathers. Therefore, there must be uh, adequately trained air crew on each operation, and we also need properly maintained aircrafts. Sometimes we need uh, regular or irregular maintenance and repair, and this affects a number of serviceable aircrafts. However, as mentioned in the report, we'll review the uh, procedure to make the uh, maintenance work more efficient. Now, Chairman, the GFS is a unique government department. It is also one of the few uh, fleets in the world with multi-role mission of rescue and search, enforcement and air ambulance services. Um, the uh, aircrafts will need aircrafts or air crew members will need to have different skills and to maintain round-the-clock operation. And we also need different equipments, and we also need to. Um, uh, we're, we're also confined by the uh, local weather and the busy air, uh, airport traffic. However. We have been facing up to challenges, be it um, searching and rescuing um, injured persons during um, foggy days or to uh, rescue a shipwreck uh, crew from the choppy waters by winching during typhoons. We will um, spare no effort in uh, our rescue and mi mission. Uh, we save thousands of lives every year, and we should acknowledge the contribution of GFS. We thank the audit report for um, giving good recommendations for the department to enhance its service and the management level to provide better services for the public. And the GFS will continue to be professional and act, uh, seriously follow up on the various recommendations of the audit report. Um, my colleagues and I will be happy to take uh, comments from members and to answer members' questions. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Well, if necessary, the uh, Secretary speaking notes is Gen 2, R64 to Gen 2. So, Secretary and your team, we have received three letters from the unions. So, I believe the papers have been tabled and they have made uh, certain recommendations on uh, establishment, which is related to this report. So we have accepted their submissions. They will be filed, and uh, my colleagues will be asking questions on uh, these submissions as well. Mr. Ng, please, uh, uh, your turn. All right, thank you, Chairman, and I welcome you to uh, the hearing of the Public Accounts Committee. And I thank you for help, uh, helping us in giving evidence. And uh, just now, Chairman mentioned several submissions made by unions and associations. This also helps us in taking evidence. Now, this is Chapter 2 of the audit report, Operation of the Government Flying Service. I'd like to say a few words on this chapter first. This chapter is on the Government Flying Service, which was established in 1993 under GFS Ordinance Cap 322 to provide services including supporting the government and to provide um, round-the-clock flying services to the public in a safe, efficient and cost-effective manner. And I emphasize round-the-clock flying services. Now, uh, value for money will be our perspective in a moment in taking evidence from you on your work under CAP 322 in relation to resources and your service. Now, the report shows that the GFS has done a lot of work, and uh, on the whole, uh, safety standards are met. Of course, in a moment, we'll be asking questions on uh, areas of I improvement 
as pointed out in the audit report. As and as mentioned, we see uh, that your services include air ambulance, search and rescue, firefighting, and you also have quantifiable targets. And I will be taking evidence from you on this area first. And we will divide our questioning session into different parts according to the audit report. That is uh, provision of flying service, management of aircrew, procurement of aircrafts and spare parts, so on and so forth. We'll be asking questions respectively on these areas. So let's start with the first part. That is part two of chapter two, provision of flying services. I'd like to ask a question here. Now, in part two, para 2.2, it say, states that the GFS accord priorities to different tasks. So from A to E, the report seems to be talking about priorities. So first of all, there is essential aircrew training and examination. to acquire or maintain air crew categories, flight crew licenses and qualifications. The second one is air tests. And then C, primary tasks, including emergency operations such as air ambulance service, search and rescue, operational support to the Hong Kong police force and other bureaus or departments in relation to civil emergencies and airborne f firefighting. And then the last two points, basic pilot training, recruitment, and lastly, GFS resources were not required by the primary task, how the secondary task should be uh, performed by the GFS with the resources. So I'd like to know. In relation to the uh, use of resources internally, it accounts for a certain proportion. So internal use takes up a certain proportion of resources from A to B, aircrew training and air tests. They account for a certain percentage. Is there a guideline on this percentage? And Will it cause um, uh, an impact on the service efficiency in the, and on meeting performance targets on the, uh, this allocation of um, resources? And I have another question. For the controller, in according priorities, does he have this decision making power? And on what basis does he make decisions? And uh, what are the criteria? And the controller may not take part in uh, these tasks round the clock, and will de the power be delegated to uh, other? Offices and is there such a mechanism of power delegation? Say, if the controller is not in the office, uh, how will the uh, A and B be dealt with? Well, secretary, if you don't mind, I will ask the controller to take your question, take the questions. But if necessary, you can supplement. Um, before you answer the questions, I'll give you some time if necessary, to make elucidation. If not, then please answer his questions. <coughs> thank you. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Nguyen Singh, for your questions. I'd like to 
explain about para 2.2 from A to E. A and P are only given priority above C, that is, other emergency operations in only very uh, rare circumstances. This is because uh, for uh, B, our major concern is that we have a limited number of uh, uh, pilots and, and aircraft which can provide service. In that case, it definitely would require our crew and our pilots and our planes to be able to operate uh, properly before we would provide service. Operationally, however, we would definitely have the have you know uh, more than the minimum the required minimum number of uh, pilots and planes uh, available. So the, in our daily operations, we would uh, operate according to the priorities as laid down in paragraph two point eight. Yes, please go on. In paragraph 2.8, we have our well, members can start from line 3. You find that the, uh, the GFS has actually laid down priority guidelines in meeting competing demands for its primary task. For example, when uh, we are on normal search operations and when there is a more uh, competing, uh, you know, uh, emergency, we have emergency demand, for example, the need to, for example, uh, rescue patients suffering from uh, cardiac diseases and so on, then our planes will leave the scene of search and, when, and then go on to take on the more uh, urgent task. So the priority guidelines, according to our operational manual, uh, are, are clearly laid down. Uh, to give you one simple example, if we have planes which are on training, well, at the same time we receive a call requesting us to, you know, conduct some uh, search and rescue, then we will stop the training and, and go on the mission for the search and rescue. So members can therefore rest assured uh, regarding this point. Uh, what about the second question? Well, that is, when you are not on duty, uh, would you could you show us your organisational chart? Yes. Let me uh, explain to members how we uh, operate. In relative, because it's not possible that I don't uh, that I be on duty 24 hours around the clock. If I'm not on duty, then our operational team. I think we have the operational manager who is in charge, and for every shift uh, during the daytime, we do have you know an officer in charge for each shift. In the evening, the pilots on duty in the evening for the evening shift will also take up this role. So. Around the clock, we do have senior pilots helping us with the supervisory duties. I'd like to follow up on paragraph a question uh, with a question on paragraph two point three of the report. That is, in your controller officer's report, you have actually uh, twenty set twenty three performance targets which is a good thing. And we're told that the 23 performance targets would cover the four major types of primary tasks, including air ambulance service, search and rescue, law enforcement, and fire fighting operations. For these four major uh, types of work, each of them are equally important. But should there be uh, many demands or many call for service at the same time uh, involving these four different types of tasks. How would you make the necessary arrangements?
to ensure that we can have, you know, you know, ensure there is satisfactory performance. Uh, Captain Chen, perhaps you can uh, explain in greater detail points C and D under paragraph two and two. Well, Chairman, for these different tasks like uh, 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 search and rescue, ambulance, air ambulance service, each of these tasks uh, on on itself are important, but it's difficult for us to uh, to actually compare the priorities for these four different tasks. So our pilots and supervisory staff on duty would uh, uh, first obtain detailed information from the uh, departments requesting for assistance. Then our pilots will analyze such information carefully to see which uh, uh, request is more important. And then internally, we would work out the priorities. Well, in that case, you do have. Uh, perhaps I could say that you, you, you may you need to be very flexible, and you may not have rigid guidelines uh, defining which particular uh, request for service would would have higher priorities. I would now like to go to paragraph two point four. Of the eleven thousand one hundred seventy five call outs, uh, very often uh, you may receive more than one call out at the same time. And you've explained to us just now how you deal with those scenarios. But in paragraph 2.4, we understand that 23. Uh, uh, out of the 23 on scene time targets, there are six for which you have not been able to achieve the target, and this is explained further in Annex Appendix A. For five consecutive hours, you've not achieved the targets, the on on scene time targets. So I'd like to ask whether you have a criterion to define the on scene uh, time targets. And is there any discrepancy between the actual, uh, you know, performance and the on scene time targets? And if you have the opportunity to amend that target, and also what are the reasons, the objective reasons for the on, for the failure to achieve on time, uh, or on scene time targets? Uh, so, I don't know whether or not. Uh, you'll be able to make any unilateral improvements. Sometimes the delays are caused by objective factors. So when you set these targets, have you been too uh, optimistic? So what is the reason for that, Mr. Chan? <laughs> Mr. Chan, uh, what are the criteria to determine whether or not you've achieved the targets? Uh, because you may be facing conflicting service demands. So, uh, as you've told us uh, under paragraph 2.2 C and E, could you explain to us, uh, that is, uh, how, what factors will determine uh, how you'll be able to achieve your on scene time targets? You understand my question? I understand, uh, Chairman. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the chairman and Mr. Ng for the questions. Mr. Ng's first question was about our performance pledge and the targets set in that performance pledge. Uh, whether or not we've set the target <clears throat> a long time ago and we have been too aggressive in setting the target. When the first targets were first set, it was in early 2000. Over the years, other than Except for one or two services for which there have been some amendments, the the, the other targets have not been uh, amended. We admit that times have changed. Air traffic has also changed. Many of the uh, environmental factors have also changed, and and therefore we need to make timely adjustments and reviews to see whether improvements could be made. Secondly, it uh, uh, members ask. 
about the reason for our failure to achieve the uh, the uh, on scene time targets? Was it uh, due to uh, factors beyond our control? Now, if one goes to uh, chart one, uh, one can see or, or go to figure one. You will find out the reasons for the out of pledge call out cases, the 902 cases, uh, eight or the eight percent, uh, the non compliance rate. You would find that for what uh, uh, you know, whether limitations and uh, uh, would be beyond our control, and for air traffic control delay, again, this is something which is beyond our control. Our crew and our maintenance staff have, uh, you know, ensure day in and day out that the uh, uh, aircrafts are ready for service. But uh, for the pre-flight uh, test and also after uh, we've started to fly, we've discovered that there are any mechanical problems. We will still, uh, first of all, uh, g you know, uh, give safety the, the top priority and ensure that the uh, plane will be able to land safely and then we will deploy a replacement aircraft uh, on the mission. And so again, this is something which is beyond our control. For others, the nine that is ninety percent of the nine hundred two out of pledge cases. For the others, they include, uh, for example, uh, uh, Due to, uh, due to the fact that we have rescue equipment on our planes, and we, if these planes are called to uh, to assist in a firefighting operation, we will need to remove such equipment and then uh, remove the benches, the seats, and the equipment before we can send the plane uh, to on a firefighting rescue. So the plane will need will need to be equipped differently when it goes on a firefighting mission. And our mechanical staff would immediately, uh, you know, make the necessary arrangement. But the assembly and the dismantling equipment take time. In these scenarios, or rather, we have such scenarios uh, because we have a limited number of planes. And in order that we can achieve value for money. We have used the minimum number of planes to achieve the optimal, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 effect. We would therefore not deliberately buy a particular buy a plane here for a specific purpose, and if nobody requests require such services, the, the plane will not be deployed. That would not be uh, cost effective. So for the category others, again, it is beyond our control, unless we have unlimited resources. Well, that is a question we have to face. Regarding the 51 remaining cases, uh, engagement of crew members in other tasks. Again, this is a question of uh, how we can make the best use of our limited resources. Let's say we are now, if we are on on a rescue operation, and and then we receive another call for to to assist in uh, asking us to assist in another rescue operation. If we do not have another plane that could be deployed, especially in the evening, when we only have one uh, team, if there is a second request for service. We certainly will not be able to meet our performance pledge. Basically, this is a question of resource allocation, and again, that is something beyond our control, which is beyond our control. Mr. Ngluck Singh, I think you can, you know, continue your questions uh, in your second round. Alan, thank you. You have fifteen minutes. Sorry, ten. Ten minutes. Okay. Thank you. I note that when the secretary spoke uh, in the beginning of our hearing, he had confirmed 
the uh, unique nature of the GFS. It is the unique GFS in the world which actually under the duties of rescue operations, uh, uh, you know, ambulance and, uh, and, 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 so, and other functions uh, said that we need to ensure that the planes are safe, the crew will need to be adequately trained, and there should be proper uh, inspection and maintenance of the planes. But if we look at the result of the audit, we we're told that there is a shortage of pilots and the uh, we also have a shortage of uh, aircraft technicians and engineers and uh, you are requiring your 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 captains uh, to, uh, to 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 work more than the scheduled hours, and we've also received submissions from the unions, from the air, uh, aircraft engineers, and the uh, and the flying service aircraft technicians union. Uh, uh, confirming the shortfall. There is also a problem in respect of procurement, whether it's the procurement of spare parts and also the delivery timetable for the seven new helicopters. The result of the, the findings of the audit actually uh, indicate something that is worrying. So may I ask the Secretary this? In 2003, on the 27th of May uh, 2013, uh, uh, you've met with the security panel in June of the same year when you obtained funding from the FC. You had told this council uh, or explained to us, uh, answer the question regarding the seven helicopters and also uh, uh, staff uh, 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 deployment. So, re so given that we now have the result of the audit. Could the secretary tell this uh, committee how you intend to uh, 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 ensure that resources, uh, you know, for the GFS could be more e more effectively uh, uh, utilized? We understand that the GFS. Uh, uh, because of the uh, increase in the call for service, uh, uh, indeed, uh, the, 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 the whole team is under a lot of pressure. We understand that there is also the, the, the question of the wastage of senior you know, uh, uh, crew members and staff. So the GFS, therefore, has conducted a review and a study. Earlier, the Security Bureau in the financial year for 2015-2016, reserve a fund to conduct a human resources management study for the GFS to ensure that it can cope with the increasing demand for services. At the same time, the Audit Commission has conducted this value for money audit for the GFS, and therefore the pace of our, our work has been slowed down uh, a bit. We believe that the audit co uh, committee commission's report may have recommendations, which uh, suggest that which can actually help when we engage a consultant to help us, you know, conduct that review. The report is now published, and the report recommends that when we conduct that study, we must, in respect of the recommendations in the audit report, take those recommendations uh, into consideration. We are now collating the relevant materials. We will, as soon as possible, uh, uh, complete our task, after which we will invite tenders. As members have heard just now, the GFS is a very unique service. To hire a consultant to help us conduct a study, I believe the, the it would not be easy for the consultant to actually form a team uh, to, to, to help conduct this review. It takes time. So we hope we will be able to start this uh, as soon as possible so that 
in the long we can look at the for we will find out how the GFS in the long term what it should do in terms of its equipment and and its human resources requirements. And and in the light of such uh, demand, we will fight for resources according to the recommendations of the consultants report. In the short term, we'll look into ways as to how we can the GFS can can actually uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, ensure that we there will we can relieve the the pressure in terms of manpower shortage. Mr. Chair, please please be more focused because we do have limited time. Thank you, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let me uh, follow up on the consultant's report. First of all, at the present stage, we haven't yet started the consultant's uh, uh, study or the report, uh, but we are already doing something in terms of manpower deployment. For example, in the report, there is a section or there is a chart which shows our manpower situation. Uh, in part three, there is a. Uh, we're looking at table eight, table eight, and in our operational manual, it shows that in general uh, we will, for example, for A shift, B shift, and C shift, uh, uh, how many people we would deploy for the team. Basically. Uh, uh, we deploy the uh, uh, the uh, staff uh, according to the uh, pool of uh, pilots we have. Kong Kong, la, ha, yi ko fei ah fei ge si ah gong wei la. Um, the uh, aircraft captains union just sent in a letter. And uh, this would be included in our bundle. Um, Alan, did he address your question? No, he hasn't. Perhaps I will put it another way, and I'll try to be more focused in my question. Um, on the maintenance of aircraft, the situation is a little bit um, tense. Um, the fleet is already fairly small, um, and due to the unscheduled maintenance tasks, um, the downtime would even be longer. So, uh, with inadequate maintenance and inadequate number of air um, air crew staff, the technicians are very very busy, and um, as the union said. The engineers um, have failed to tackle um, design and maintenance effectively. Every year, the number of call out hours have increased, and um, this has placed stress on the aircraft through wear and tear. And, um, and um, you have seen constant manpower lost, and a lot of engineers and technicians have left. So this is a vicious cycle. So before the consultancy study is published, what are you going to do with it? I'd like to know what you think. Is there anything um, you can do in the short term because we cannot allow the situation to go any longer. Thank you very much, Chairman. In terms of maintenance, our current practice um, is to conduct um, 
every day and periodic maintenance at the same time in order to reduce the downtime for our aircrafts. Um, but of course, we won't be able to reduce the downtime drastically, but um, we would try to um, um, deal with that as much as we can. And um, for all sorts of air crew members, including captains, technicians, etc., um, we currently adopt a flexible um, shift system. And uh, during peak times, for example, Qingming Festival, um, and uh, during times um, during the vulnerable days, we would deploy more staff. And um, during the less vulnerable days, we would um, cut down on the number of um, staff deployed. And this has proved effective in the past. In terms of the number of aircrafts available um, during the vulnerable days or days of um, high fire hazard, um, our engineers would prepare aircrafts for um, overnight operations or for fire rescue operations, and um, as such, we can be more flexible with our deployment. And um, for the uh, captain and air crew member grades, we employed some non-civil service contract staff, some foreign staff, um, to help us out in the short term. Of course, this is not a long-term solution. And um, we hope that the consultancy study can uh, give us more recommendations going ahead. Ellen, perhaps you can wait for the next round. Paul, you have 10 minutes as a member of the Hong Kong public. And um, I'd like to applaud the GFS's efforts over the years. Um, the GFS is very professional, and um, they have to overcome all sorts of adverse conditions, including weather. Um, I hope uh, through this hearing, I just hope you can uh, make better use of your resources. And um, according to Cap 322 of, um, of the ordinance, the scope of service is very wide. And um, they are at the forefront of um, flying services. And I'd like to, I'd like you to look at table two. Um, there are different types of tasks, including um, air ambulance service, search and rescue, law enforcement, etc. And um, in the fifth column, um, for other services, for bureaus and departments. And um, it consists more than 40% of the total um, amounts of flying service provided. And um, it includes um, trans transportation, um, oil spill monitoring, etc. And um, when you look at 2.2 and 2.23, whether you use um, the Super Puma helicopters or or the uh, Dolphin helicopters, um, the, um, the, the costs were both very high, and um, they exceed 35000 and $23,000 per hour. And um, it was taken on records that you, uh, you facilitate 26 VIP um, uh, um, uh, transportations every year, but um, very often, you have not provided a list of the, the list of VIPs you served. So um, who can actually um, use this service? Uh, is it the secretaries and um, anyone who are above the secretary grade? Secretary, can you explain that, please? Um, I'm um, legally empowered to set up certain rules. And um, the um, according to um, Cap 360 of the general regulations, 
certain individuals can request or service from the government flying service and um for uh, and um I also authorize um the controller of g f s to have such discretion and um anyone applying for such service must give their reasons, and the controller would vet the application um apart from non emergency services there is a um crucial factor or requirement um the tasks we list out under C must take priority and um and um during um when when we have um vacant aircrafts they would be considered so they certainly um won't be afforded the same priority as our main tasks um I'd like to talk about the cost effectiveness um and uh, in paragraph two point two three on the cost effectiveness our um it takes about ten years to train to fully train uh, a pilot and um our pilots would have to accumulate about three thousand hours of um um flight time or flying time and and um they would provide different types of services for the public um for example the uh, um the hong kong observatory um might request us to um um conduct some observations and maintenance work and um for our junior pilots such experience is valuable and um without the um one thousand and thirty eight hours of flying experience um we would have to arrange another one thousand five hundred and thirty eight hours of flying experience and um as the secretary said, we would only conduct these tasks during our downtime and we would um and they would also help um train our pilots um we spend a lot of hours training our pilots every year when you look at um the notes and um every year the the, tr the training hours come to more than 1500 hours or 2600 20, hours rather and um they serve as a kind of training for our pilots so um in my opinion this is most efficient and effective from the government's perspective um you only have about 370 million dollars of budget every year um and of course we understand that there's a need to train our pilots but at the same time the government has um promoted the user pays principle apart from meeting training needs departments that require your help would have to pay themselves have you considered this um approach as i understand um the government has um, something known as a trading fund um i think the report by the director of audits we need to highlight these costs and um remind the heads of bureaus and departments that there is a cost associated every time they apply for the service they should bear this in mind as the controller said um if we adopt the user pays principle um if the departments have uh, do not have a money to spend they would um um they would not require request for service as much but they they would have to fly nonetheless
Um, of course, we would remind the heads of the bureaus and departments that they should bear this in mind. Um, but at, at the same time, we want to make the best use of resources, Paul. And uh, during the uh, executive summary, starting from paragraph 1.3, And a set of guidelines was published in 1995, and um, there was a protocol stating that the CAD would be responsible for um, for monitoring the GFS's service or, or audit the GFS's service. So has the CAD done a good job in monitoring? The GFS as well. Thank you very much for the question. According to paragraph 1.3 A and B, um, the Civil Aviation Department is the only air controlling body in Hong Kong, and every year they would conduct a thorough audit of the GFS every year. And um, they would audit our operations and maintenance. These are the two main scopes. They would mainly audit the GFS as um, a transportation service provider. Um, but for other tasks, um, we have little to do with civil aviation, and um, we would invite military bodies from other countries every year to conduct thorough audits. So we would have annual or periodic um, audits by experts. Mr. Gary Chen, 10 minutes, minutes please. Um, again, I applaud the GFS's efforts over the years, um, especially rescue operations and their assistance to um, law enforcement work. And uh, according to GFS, they, their priorities um, are on training. Um, um, pilot flights and rescue operations. I'd like you to turn to um, page twenty nine in the in the audit report. And note fourteen. I think um, we can all see that the GFS is undermanned. And around thirty Five to forty percent of the pilots are in different different phases of training, and so not all pilots are equipped to carry out um, all types of missions or tasks in the shifts. And um, under had 166 of this year's budget and um, in 2013 to 14 and um, 833 um, flying hours were stipulated for airplanes and um, 1622 hours for helicopters so training is very important but if we have 35 to 40 percent of our pilots in training, would the ratio be too high? And um, as I mentioned, in 2013 to 14, the government spends 2,600 flying hours for training, and the total cost is 12.8 million dollars. And um, two fixed-wing planes um, have spent 60 percent of their um, time in training, and um, would they 
um, since the race, uh, the percentage is so high, would their service quality be compromised? Can you explain the significance of your training efforts? Can you explain why there is a need for this constant training? Thank you, Chairman. See that. Well, pilot training for our service is very different from the pilot training for civil aviation because, as you can imagine, for a flight from Hong Kong to Japan, after taking off, when it reaches a, an altitude of 35 to 40,000 uh, uh, feet, it takes about five hours before the plane lands. However, for our operation, well, taking fixed-wing aircrafts, for example, we may need to undertake a search and rescue operation uh, during typhoon weather. And you may recall, when there is a typhoon in Hong Kong, on TV, on radio, you would you would hear the announcement that uh, the uh, civil aviation flights would be suspended after 3 p.m., for example. However, it is only at this time that our pilots begins to be on standby, and if necessary, w the pilots would be called out for missions or operations, and they may be flying in low al altitudes for search and rescue operation namely 300 to 500 meters um, and our feet, uh, whereas for civil aviation, the altitudes are 35,000 to 40,000 feet. And that means we're flying very close to the uh, sea service and in this inclement weather, and we also need to locate survivors and inform helicopters to rescue them. And when the whole operation is completed, we will need to fly back to Hong Kong because Hong Kong is our uh, primary uh, destination. Only when the weather is too bad would we consider other locations. So the operation is very different, and as a result, we have a different requirement for our pilot. So this explains why we need so much training. We need to ensure that um, each and every operation of ours is 200% safe, including aircraft maintenance. Well, you may ask why we have so many hours of uh, downtime for maintenance, because we need to ensure that our aircrafts are 200% safe. Because uh, our aircrafts were deployed on, uh, in, uh, in times when uh, the uh, civil aviation aircrafts have been suspended. Well, please allow Captain to continue first. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Another point I'd like to respond to is uh, that in 2013, the, we have a high uh, number of hours for uh, fixed-wing aircraft training. In 2013, we recruited new cadet pilots, who, uh, new pilots as well as cadet pilots who just completed uh, training. Before that, several experienced pilots left the grade, and we had the round of recruitment, so at that time, we actually stepped up training. A follow-up question, Chairman, for the government, whether they have ways to reduce the proportion of hours spent on training, because as you, uh, uh, as you mentioned, you procured two training aircrafts for training pilots. But as mentioned in the audit report, you did not really use the uh, training aircrafts to train pilots because they remain unused for so many hours. So I don't understand why, instead of using the uh, fixed-wing crafts designated for training purpose, you use 
aircrafts that are supposed to be used for operations to train pilots. So if you can use the fixed wing aircrafts J41 for training purposes, why do you still need to procure the uh, two training aircrafts, pilot uh, a diamond and the other one for training? Is it because there is uh, different training modes or different training needs? Controller. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Maybe I'll defer to my Chief Training uh, Pilot, uh, pilot um, Captain Marshall, to uh, explain to you. Captain Marshall. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, firstly, I'd like to point out that the, the training process, both for the, for the aeroplane pilots and for the helicopter pilots, is a very complex process. Um, as an example, it's been mentioned earlier on that it takes up to 10 years for a, for a captain to become fully qualified. During these 10 years, the pilots would, on the helicopter stream would go through 16, that's one six, uh, different courses of training. And these are incremental courses that have been carefully structured according to our training manual. During these 16 courses, some of the training is conducted on the ground and a lot of it is conducted in the air. And I hope that you can appreciate that in between the training courses, the pilots also have to go through suitable periods of consolidation. So they actually have to get operational experience on top of the training that they get. And this is why it takes one of the reasons it takes so long because it's a complex process. Now talking about the, the, the training hours and the use of the training aircraft, again it's difficult to explain in a, in a simple way but the two fixed wing training aircraft were procured for two quite different things really. Looking back to 2006 when we purchased the small single engine Zlin uh, training aircraft, it was in the aftermath of Typhoon Prapirun, which you probably remember very well. Um, GFS was, was very heavily involved in that, uh, that typhoon. And we, in fact, we picked up almost 100 uh, people with three helicopters and, uh, and one fixed-wing aircraft. Looking back, the management decided that the advantage that we had at the time was that our pilots that flew that rescue mission had, in their history, they'd done some flying on a small fixed-wing aerobatically capable air aircraft but at the time our junior uh, aircrew did, didn't have that advantage we no longer had that type of aircraft available for us so we wanted to enhance the basic handling skills for the for the pilots and also give them some exposure to some difficult decision making processes that they would encounter in such severe weather conditions so this is why we procured the first of the the single engine aerobatic aircraft over the next four years, the environment changed. Um, we were procuring the, the new jet aircraft to, to replace the J-41, the aging aircraft, and we could see that the, the, the middle batch of, of junior pilots were not getting enough hours to accumulate for, for an airline transport pilot's license. So we looked at the procurement of the light twin-engine aircraft as a way for them to accumulate hours. Now, this aircraft is totally different from the single-engine aircraft. It flies long range, uh, over water, in all weathers, and the cockpit display is very similar to the one in the large jet. So on the one hand, we have a, a, a quite simple, basic skills development aircraft, which was procured in 2006. And on, in 2011, we procured the, the, the twin-engine, uh, long-range capable aircraft. So, so two different reasons uh, for, for the procurement of the two aircraft. I hope that mostly answers your question, Mr. Chan. Has your question been answered? All right. Gary Chan, I will leave in a moment. So can you answer this question? For the two training aircrafts, Well, they are underutilized as for other operational aircrafts. They are in, uh, used for training instead of um, being deployed on operations. So uh, you explain that uh, even when they take on uh, guests on uh, uh, flights, uh, it's for the purpose of training. 
so you explain. Or perhaps you can elaborate on Mr. Gary Chan's question. Fixed swing aircrafts training. Like helicopters. Sometimes, well, we work with government departments, other government departments. Sometimes we work alone. But I can reassure you that be it training or aerial survey or aerial photography or other missions, as soon as we receive emergency call outs, we will end the secondary task immediately and respond to emergency call outs. You don't have to doubt that. Kenneth. Thank you, Chairman. Well, other members already asked about a manpower issue, but I'd like to know more details on the operation side. So please refer to the audit report, page 24 in the Chinese version. That is part 3, page 29 in the English version. Kenneth, we're still on part 2. I don't have any question on part 2. So let's see if other members have, still have any questions on part two before we move on to part three. Mr. Alan Leung is waiting for the second round, and Mr. Ng Leung Singh as well. Mr. Ng Leung Singh, any other questions on part two? Yes, some follow up ones. Is it my turn? Or perhaps can you allow Mr. Alan Leung to go first because um, he need to leave by 10.30. So on the provision of flying services in part two, well, just now um, I got some answers on the policies uh, of the GFS. Now, something about the operation. For example, in 2.28 of the audit report on recording passenger information. And on enforcement support, we believe the uh, GFS has contributed significantly in enforcement operations. So in uh, point A or B of 2.28A1, uh, maintaining proper records of all passengers carried on such flights. I have a technical question. As far as law enforcement is concerned, were there any difficulties uh, resulting in not being able to keep records of passengers had it to do with privacy of passenger data. So, and uh, if we, for the sake of accountability, ask for more information, what can you do and what would be your difficulties? And would you be able to um, work on the audit's recommendation? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Sutton, for your question. On 2.28, A1, well, let's refer to the to Table 2. There are different types of flying service. Other services for bureaus and departments. As mentioned before, there will be sufficient information for passengers, uh, of passengers. However, for air ambulance and other uh, law enforcement operations, we regard them as emergency call outs, a rescue operation. For example, in the South China Sea, some uh, fishermen. Um, uh, fell into the water, and definitely we would rescue them first. And uh, afterwards, we would um, post record the uh, information uh, for the uh, proper keeping of records. 
So uh, I'd like to reassure members that. So in your logbook, you have all the details. Right, but this will be done after the operation because during an emergency call out, uh, it would not be impossible for us to ask the, the uh, uh, distressed person his name, for example. Well, say if the police is, uh, if the police requires your service, if, for example, in the arrest of a suspect, then would you be required to record the personal data? Of the suspect, his name, his uh, his uh, the, the name, the gender, and the age. Because I think, as far as this is concerned, there should be some uh, guidelines, say, for suspects. For example, uh, is it the case that you would only record um, certain? Personal data. Well, during special law enforcement operations, we would rely on uh, the police in keeping proper records. Usually, we would only record the nature of the call out, uh, the number of passengers, as for well a detailed record. Under such circumstances, the police would be uh, keeping the record. And uh, from our perspective, there was no need to keep this information. Well, that has to do with the response from the government 2.30C. The GFS will con also continue to produce daily occurrence review reports and weekly event summary reports and highlight the out-of-pledge cases for review and monitoring by the senior management. So this is important because it's a performance-related matter. Is it transparent enough? Can anyone monitor that? I think this is important. And the from the response from the government to the audit, I'm happy to see this undertaking. And that uh, the monitoring mechanism is now more intact. However, there must be a, a reasonable scope as far as the daily occurrence is concerned. For us to look at whether the task prioritization is reasonable or the utilization of resources is reasonable. So uh, anything to add as far as the operation is concerned? And uh, by uh, using the word highlight here, uh, do, would you say that um, the highlight would be sufficient for monitoring by senior management? Because in the report it's been mentioned that uh, some guest passengers' uh, information are not recorded. Thank you, Chairman. As mentioned in 2.30C, the GFS will continue to produce daily occurrence review reports and weekly event summary reports. And the review will be conducted by experienced and senior management. And if problems are identified, we'll take immediate follow up action to ensure that all necessary details are included. Well, as mentioned just now, there may be uh, law enforcement operations in which we, did, we do not have um, the details, but we will liaise with the law enforcement departments concerned, and if necessary, say if we're under audit, we could refer to the fire reference. so that they could check for details for those occurrences. So it's the, the most important thing is to 
uh, know where the source of the details would be, and we can give this undertaking. Mr. Uh, no, I'm saying 2.29, para 2.29. Audit has recommended that hospital authority should closely monitor the implementation of and compliance with the updated casualty evacuation guidelines by its medical staff to see if further enhancement is necessary. So this is for the CEO of Hospital Authority. I'd like to know whether this is already sufficient in transporting uh, injured persons in an evacuation situation and that um, there will be a full cooperation. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, indeed. In April, the hospital authority issued the updated casualty evacu evacuation guidelines for its medical staff. As far as our daily operation is concerned, <coughs> we um, note that there have been more cases for Type B ambulance air ambulance service for the transportation um, transportation of uh, injured persons. We respect the professional judgment of the medical staff of HA. We don't think well since uh, we the updated guidelines have been issued we are, are very confident that the uh, HA staff would make a professional judgment my last question is respect of paragraph 222 and 23 and, and that is the uh, annual figures, and also you proactively disclose the service you provide to departments and the cost involved. I think Paul also referred to this earlier. There are two figures here. Uh, first of all, for EC155 is 23,800 odd dollars per hour, and for the Super Puma is 35,000 dollars per hour. For these two disclosures, do you think this arrangement is sufficient? Uh, because some of the uh, uh, familiarization flight are also, you know, conducted uh, in conjunction with your training. So have you had encountered any difficulties? I think the uh, secretary already have answered the question in relation to 2.23. So what I what I'm trying to say is that I mean this uh, sort of service take up quite a, lo a large proportion of your service. On the one hand, you're you're able to help the bureau and departments. On the other hand, you're also training your own staff. The cost is rather unique because the cost is used uh, is incurred to serve both purposes. Um, uh, one may argue that it's very expensive, but at the same time, you are also you know are training your people. So, the last sentence in paragraph two point two three. E.g., through proactive disclosure of the cost of services provided to those uh, uh, bureaus and departments, how are you going to reflect that? Are you just telling us, going to tell us that you spent three hours using a super Puma helicopter, and therefore for three hours it costs you more than a hundred thousand dollars? You send them an invoice, although you don't, you know, charge them for the money, you will still give them the uh, the invoice. At the same time, you told us that uh, on these, uh, you know, flights, you're also training your own people. So how much of that will go under cost for training? Because if you do not differentiate between the two, then in future, when we conduct value for money order, we want to find out when we want to find out what not it's worthwhile for you to uh, uh, do this, and whether or not there is a, a need to for uh, review. I believe this is a uh, crucial information. So, how how do you uh, see this, controller? Thank you, Mr. Mm raised 
uh, a very important question, and that is every time we go on uh, respond to a call for service, how many percent of that is is for training, and how how many percent uh, do we really provide uh, the service to our clients? Well, that is a difficult question to answer, uh, but overall speaking, we believe that. Uh, uh, as the secretary said, we need to remind the other service users, be they bureaus and departments, that they must have this uh, concept that you know if they use our service, they are using taxpayers' money. However, in the end, how are we going to you know uh, you know uh, reflect the cost? Uh, of using the uh, the super puma or whatever per hour, how many percent uh, of that is used for the provision of service, and how much w would be spent on training? We would need to go back and 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 consider this more carefully and in greater detail, so that we can tell the public how much money we have spent on provision of service and how much we have spent on, on training. We need to look into that further. I think Mr. Le Ng is only giving you a suggestion. The secretary already uh, told us already that uh, the 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 charges could be notional. But Mr. Ng is saying that we want uh, greater transparency. And secondly, now uh, that you uh, you see that well, with the uh, uh, letters from the unions. You, you you would notice that other than the, 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 the views expressed by the union, I think we also need to look at uh, what you do from a value for money angle. And there is also the need for transparency. And if you and I and I think Mr Leung uh, uh, our colleague uh, represent the industry, and I'm sure he will be able to help you as well. We are only uh, looking at all these issues from the perspective of the Public Accounts uh, uh, Committee. Secretary, I think the Chairman already reminded me of what I actually wanted to say earlier. We need to look at this globally. When we conduct training, it's difficult for us to uh, specifically, uh, you know, you know, say that this is for training. But if we give a figure, uh, this is actually a figure that will enable everybody to know. Uh, for example, how, uh, for example, if we want to provide the details on what we do on a particular hour uh, of a flight, and given the tight manpower situation, even if we did that, I think yeah, I mean the, the the account may even look more complicated, and the public will be even more confused. Well, secretary, certainly you 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 are short of funds, and and next time certainly you should ask for more funding. Ellen Leung. I also like to follow up on part two. For part two, I note that when the secretary spoke at the beginning of our hearing this morning, he already agreed that he would uh, uh, follow up on the controller's report in those areas where they've admitted that there are shortfalls, and I understand, and I, I appreciate that. The secretary. Uh, also indicated that he would uh, accept wholesale all the inadequacies pointed out by the audit commission. For example, the 800 odd cases of uh, 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 where service was refused, and also he mentioned that the, the, the names of the VIPs. Uh, he will also, you know, provide for such information. And that he would uh, also conduct a review, for example, after a plane has completed its before it com has finished its first mission and received a second order. How do you record that? He has uh, indicated that he would he, he he has accepted the recommendations of the director of audit, and I welcome that. However, there are two points that I like to follow up. If you look 
at table one or page nine of the Chinese uh, uh, version of the reason for the 902 out of pledge call out cases. 16 percent was due to the uh, uh, fact that the aircrafts were not serviceable or that the crew members were engaged in other tasks. Uh, I think the uh, the department is now uh, uh, well, of course the departments will need to be accountable to the legislature and if I look at the uh, look at r sixty four info five and the paper of the uh, security panel. Uh, Mr. Lee Ka Chiu represented the Bureau in attending the panel meeting. Uh, Mr. Chen was also present at the time, the controller. At that time, they explained to the panel that they needed to acquire seven helicopters and the relevant equipment for the GFS. And members asked at that meeting, that uh, indicated that Mr. Timothy Tong, when he uh, became the, the PAS for the Security Bureau, he asked the, he had actually asked the GFS to provide a helicopter for parachuting a public figure. The Deputy Secretary for Security at the time said that there were clear departmental guidelines and a certain criteria would need to be satisfied according to uh, ABCD of paragraph 39 before that could be done. Apparently, the controller at the time rejected uh, Mr. Timothy Tong's request. The secretary, when he spoke just now, told us that he had a set of guide. They have a set of guidelines, and 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 these will be implemented by the controller. In para 2.2, you refer to the name uh, that, uh, that you have not reviewed uh, the names of the VIPs. And so at the time when you mentioned the incident involving Mr. Timothy Tong, at the security panel, are the guidelines that you refer to then still applicable now? I think we've all along been following those guidelines. The guidelines stipulate that the approval criteria, the approved, the power to make approval was given to delegated to the controller. The controller will consider the circumstances and make a decision. It's not the case that whenever a bureau or department makes a request, the controller will, you know, you know, you know, put in a job or, or sign his name uh, and, and gives the approval. I think the guidelines are very clear. Every time we receive such a request, the request would be uh, uh, handled by a directorate staff who has been delegated the authority for the GFS. Of course, it's not possible that I would uh, follow up on each and every application. I have therefore delegated the authority to my frontline colleagues who would then uh, look at the uh, purpose of the request and the name list of the VIPs to be uh, carried. And if everything was clear, when the VIPs you know, bought our planes, we would check their IDs once again. So the procedure we adopt will be similar to that of an airline company. And in the whole process, uh, it is regrettable, of course, that in the past we have had uh, some cases where the, uh, uh, the, the, the information relating to the VIPs being carried were not very clear. But there, there had not been so, not many of such cases. The information is handled manually by our frontline staff. And perhaps uh, it was due to the uh, uh, the errors made by the frontline staff. So and therefore, we now have a daily and weekly uh, review of all the cases, and all applications from 
different departments and bureaus, we will conduct an overall review, and I'm sure the incidents members referred to earlier on will not happen again. I understand that the, the controller's answer uh, is that the result of the audit, as suggested in para 2.2, that uh, there had not been records of the VIPs being carried. Uh, it was not deliberately, you know, you know, uh, hidden by the GFS, as in the case of involving Timothy Tong at the time. Is that correct? Yes, it wasn't deliberate. You told us that uh, your procedure is similar to those of uh, uh, no, a typical commercial airline company. If you have a name list, how is it possible that you don't have the names? If you have a passenger list, if we you know, go on a plane, if our name is not on the list, then that would, we, we can't board the plane. So I think that's in, it's difficult for that scenario to, to arise. In response to Ms. Leung's question, you said you definitely would have a list. If that's the case, why do we still have the last point under para 2.2? Is it because somebody requested that the names of the guests not be included on the record? And other than the incident involving Timothy Tong, had there been other cases where the uh, Audit Commission could not uh, find out the names of the guests, the VIPs who were carried? You say you have the guidelines in place, and, and uh, could you explain further? Thank you. Going to our understanding, on this particular case, uh, we did have the names of the VIPs being carried, but it wasn't in full, it was in abbreviated form. We've also uh, left out the rank of the person who was being uh, carried. So those people could not give you the names. I think the more you explain, the more complicated it sounds. Originally, you told us that you have guidelines in place. You told us definitely there would be a name list. And now we're told that, you know, the person had a pseudonym. Uh, was a person a movie star? Or, I mean, I think if anything should happen, we want to know who's on the flight. So had something gone wrong with the guideline or your or with your implementation? I think you should go back and look at it again. You've already explained uh, the, this point, and and I think you agree that uh, these things should happen. Well, it's interesting that the VIPs use uh, fake names. No, it was an abbreviation, like Michael. Then I. So in other words, the name was abbrevi abbreviated. All right. Perhaps we only recorded the initial of the, of the guests. Okay. Well, that that's better actually. Uh, Chairman, another point which is also about accountability regarding the J forty one fixed wing uh, uh, aircraft. In 2009, on June the 12th, you went to the FC. The FC uh, approved 77, uh, uh, $776 million. That's in our 64 Info 6. We were told that the J-41 fixed wing aircraft uh, and that, uh, that all the, air, the spare parts for the aircraft would be depleted by 2013 and that those planes would break down at any time. That's why you need to switch to the jet, the jet planes. And when we come to pair 8, pair 9, page 9 of the same paper, it is envisaged that the the uh, new planes will be commissioned in March 2013. We're now in May 2015. There have been a delay of more than two years, and if you look at the paper, it's rather shocking that we were told we're told that the fixed wing aircrafts uh, I think because of the uh, the inclement weather the the the, the structural integrity of those planes would be affected as a result the uh, the the parts would be uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, damaged quickly, and in from 2013 onwards, you were not able to procure the spare parts. We don't have the jet planes yet. J41 is still in service, so is that really a serious problem? Shouldn't the controlling officer give us an, uh, an answer? 
Mr. Chan. We hope that you can give us an accurate answer, not like the one that the CAD uh, had given us when they bought the air traffic controlling system. Thank you. Let me answer the question regarding why the J41 is has kept has continued to fly be in service for two years. Originally, we said that they would there would be serious problems by 2013 2014. When we came to Let's Code uh, at the time, we did uh, indicate that there would be problems for us to procure spare parts. In the last few years, uh, we have more and more of the this model, you know, being decommissioned. So we have more supply of spare parts in the second-hand market. As a result, when we try to buy spare parts, we are under less pressure. Well, that is our estimate. We can only say that after we've uh, placed the order, how long will we have a response? And over the last few years, apparently we've seen that there has been some improvements. Of course, the production of this model has stopped, and we also are not sure that we will continue to, um, to be able to order the spare parts in the long run. The other question is how can we ensure that these planes can still continue to fly safely? And this is actually thanks to the good efforts of our technical crew uh, who had worked hard to to ensure the safety of, of our planes. And I hope members can rest assured that they will still be able to uh, provide the service safely. Go, go. Alan, anything else? So um, why was there a delay for the new jet plane? The original commissioning date was March 2013. Um, I also have a question for you, controller. Um, during the uh, auto track system, the procurement of the auto track system by the CAD, we asked them how much they spent because we have to be fair to everyone. Can you explain how much money you had to spend because of the two year delay? Um, we have complete faith and trust in you, but we do have to tackle the matter from a cost-effectiveness manner. Um, since you are asking for more than seven hundred million dollars, we need to know um, why there was a two-year delay and how much more money did you have to pay. Um, if you cannot answer it now, you can um, re respond by writing later on. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we set an upper limit on the project when we signed the project. We asked for a completely operational aircraft before the contract is fulfilled, and before and uh, only then we would pay the seven hundred million dollars. So the onus is completely on the contractor or the manufacturer. So uh, uh, we had not spent anything extra because of the delay, and. Um, the reason for the delay of the commissioning for the new aircraft was mainly due to um, flight stability. Our chief engineer brought a model of an airplane today. It hasn't been modified yet, but after modifications, we would have um, extra components at the bottom. And uh, during the trial flight in July 2013, We found that um, the the aircraft body was unstable during certain flight conditions, um, for instance, when flying at low attitudes and low speed. Um, the manufacturer was from Canada, and uh, the manufacturer was Bombardier. They are the third biggest aircraft manufacturer in the world. So um, we identified such problems, and we were notified immediately. And uh, we've been following up on this project all along since awarding the contract. And by July 2013, and um, we were actually three to four weeks ahead of time. Um, but after this flight st um, aircraft st stability issue was identified, um, the entire project was stalled, and the manufacturer. Um, um, introduce a lot of improvements, 
and um, under the aircraft body um, there there was uh, a, a processing station and as such the flow of air underneath the aircraft was affected uh, apologies because of legal considerations we we cannot share a copy of these photographs with you um i, I think we are fine um this is uh, the um old station uh um stop and um a series of improvement measures were introduced but um the uh, the issue of um instability could not be improved and uh, later on they s decided to um ditch the um old um stop and uh build a new one and uh by September of August last year this um new station successfully passed all tests so um so um the manufacturer was able to promise a new commission in day of um two one five because the um main issue with aerodynamics has been tackled Ellen um perhaps I will give you more time. It's good for us to know more about the uh, technical uh, situation. Um, we have seen the issues with other aircrafts before. Is this aircraft? Is this new aircraft the same model as those those ones? Um, various modifications have been made. Is this the same Bombardier model as the uh, problematic ones in the past? Before we purchase this craft, um, it has been used in South Korea and Denmark already. And Australia also procured four aircrafts of the same model for similar purposes. And Boeing also um, procured this aircraft. Well, that's. Uh, I was just curious, Mr. Gary Chen, please. Um, f uh, on the second part, um, I have three simple questions on part three. And under paragraph two point two two, um, on the provision of standard familiarization flights for guests, um, as mentioned, um, the the costs. For um, airplanes is about um, ten thousand dollars, and for helicopters twenty to thirty thousand dollars per hour. And um, in light of the limited aircraft resources, you are still providing standard familiarization flight service for various guests and groups. You would place great strains on manpower. And in terms of data management. You agreed um, with the improvement measures suggested by the Audit Commission. Um, when you um, when you've scheduled standard familiarization flights, um, if um, contingencies or emergencies arise, how are you going to do with it? You mentioned um, that a set of internal guidelines have been issued to various departments to prevent abuse but if you look at when you look at the information from the last 5 years um the number of call out requests from other departments have increased by almost 10% so uh, would you conduct periodic reviews to see um which departments or bureaus have made the most number of requests and would you vet whether or not their requests for call outs are reasonable um with the lack of monitoring then um, the guidelines would be rendered useless um controller please um captain chen please um tell us about your policy 
we are not experts, but we are only tackling the matter from a cost-effectiveness manner. You don't have to agree with us, but you just have to explain to us your policy. Thank you very much. And um, in table two, and um, the, the flying hours of 1,538 hours include various types of service. And um, familiarization flights consist of only 50 to 60 hours, so it's only a small part of our um, service. And other services uh, include aerial filming, um, taking our technicians to um, the mountains for repair or maintenance missions. So um, please be assured that we would not abuse the familiarization flight service. And um, out of the 1,538 flying hours or service hours, under any circumstances, when we um, receive emergency calls, we would dedicate 100% of our flying hours. So that's our principle. And um, um, our secretary and all frontline staff are well aware of that. So re you can be reassured of this. I agree with the controller, but when you look at case three, um, this case is exactly what I was trying to say. Let's say a scheduled familiarization flight is um, in place and when an emergency call out request is received, well in case three, um, a helicopter can be deployed, um, but they but yet they, they couldn't be deployed. They have to wait for um, the another helicopter to come back before um, the rescue mission can be carried out. So this is really a contradiction to your principle. Can you explain why um, this is the case? Can can you explain why case three would be um, tackled in this manner? Um, a lot of people are not familiar with case three. Perhaps you can um, explain the situation in greater detail for us, and uh, later on you can talk about your policy. In this case, um, would you like um, the pilot to um, explain the case? Yes, I, I, I think I can do it. The background of the case um, is that different aircrafts and services and um, crew members are involved. So um, basically we have two helicopters in operation at that moment and uh, we helicopters A and B are in operation and A has just returned. And um, um, the the pilot from um, helicopter A was not deployed in the emergency call out request, and uh, we had to wait for the second um, helicopter to come back. And um, um, after a turnover by the uh, pilot, he he was deployed um, to handle the call out. So this is really a, a sim um, the, the the situation in a gist. Were there any limitations in flying hours or were there any um, manpower shortage? So perhaps you can um, uh, explain to us in, in this manner. Please be um, concise. Basically, this, uh, this is an issue with monitoring at that time. Our frontline staff had been monitoring the situation minute by minute um, during flights, and at that time, um, their judgment was less than satisfactory. 
we think that if we had a more senior um, controlling officer um, um, uh, making the calls, then the situation might be better. So it, it really was a problem with um, controlling or monitoring. It had nothing to do with our service priorities. And um, under paragraph 2.26, um, between 2010 and 2014, um, there was a significant increase in air ambulance service callouts, um, mainly due to the increase in number of um, cases for Changchao and Lantau Island. Um, these days, we have more and more people visiting um, Tai O and Changchao. So, um, with the um, constant population rise, we will certainly see more. Air ambulance service call outs and uh, with limited resources, you might not be able to deal with the demand. Have you reflected the situation to relevant departments like the FEHD um, to um, ask for more rescue facilities in those islands in order to alleviate um, your burden? Have you notified Dr. Koing Man? On the situation, there's a hospital in North Lantau Island, but from Tai O to the Lantau Hospital, it takes an hour by driving. Secretary, um, we would certainly take Mr. Chen's comment on board, and we'll think about it. Um, with commissioning of the North Lantau Hospital, they are able to provide emergency care, but in in some cases, um, the, we have to um, provide service. Our helicopters have to go there. With population growth, um, there certainly would be higher demand. I think this is uh, obvious. And um, of course, we would try to um, handle the emergencies with vehicles, but sometimes helicopters are required. Um, we have a, a lot of um, um, A and E centers, and I think it really depends on the situation. And our frontline staff would make the judgment in the best interests of um, of the victim. Um, from an emergency care perspective, we have to do our best to help the injured victims. Controller, you talked about K3. Um, here at the PAC, we're not trying to put the blame on anyone. Um, we just want to make sure that you can provide ample training for your crew to provide even better service for the public. I'm very happy that you have taken our comments on board since we have to write a report later on. Um, can you tell us how you can provi prevent similar situations in the future so we can put them in our report? Sure, that's something we will do. Gary? Any other questions? If not, um, next. Kenneth, um, I have more questions on part two. Um, to follow up on what, what Mr. Ngang Singh said, he talked about the flying costs. Um, I have questions on 2.21 uh, and 2.23. Um, you, you mentioned that the average operating cost was $23,000 per hour. In other words, um, the figures listed under paragraph 2.23. Um, other government departments won't have to pay for, um, won't have to pay the GFS for using their services. So th these are just um, indicators. Um, as the witness said, um, in um, emergency callouts, these familiarization flights for guests would have to take a lower priority. 
um, well, let me give you an idea. It takes around a thousand dollars or so to fly from Hong Kong to Macau on helicopter. I'm referring to one trip. Well, it I don't think so. It takes three or four thousand dollars. Even if you notify the government departments of these internal costs, they might not be well aware of that. And um, since um, the familiarization flights have to take lower priority than the emergency callouts, you should um, really um, tighten up your guidelines. These familiarization trips are not essential in nature, and um, you, uh, although you mention uh, that you only offer such services um, in cases of public interest and with the lack of other modes of transport, apart from remote areas like the outlying islands, um, I think it won't be necessary in other areas of Hong Kong. I don't think our VIPs would visit deserted areas in Hong Kong apart from, let's say, engineering visits. If you only try to entertain certain VIPs, I think um, you, you have to think about resources because your manpower is already very limited. And uh, even if the departments are aware of the operating costs, they won't have to pay for it. S since they, they don't have to pay for it, they might try to request for services. Hold on. So even uh, as chairman says um for a helicopter trip um per passenger it's four thousand dollars then if um a helicopter is needed by a government department they should hire one um from outside uh, ten thousand dollars a dollar at uh, an hour and instead of using your service and they need to bear the risk of um, cancellation so as uh, another gov uh, the other government department should consider uh, hiring a helicopter from outside if so the first consideration is whether they have a genuine need for a helicopter uh, or whether a vessel will do so the security the security bureau should consider this uh, on the level of um, on the in interdepartmental level well, this is a policy issue. See if you can respond to that. I thank uh, Dr. Lang for your comment. But I want to point out, although I'm not the expert, Mr. Chen is the expert. I can say for the figure quoted, it may be different because of our mode of operation being different from commercial crafts. A commercial helicopter is uh, much more simpler. Say for a trip to Macau, it can take eight passengers, and then you can just divide the uh, cost. But passenger flight is not our main task. Our cost calculation uh, is based on um, uh, the breakdown of a uh, lump sum for the whole GFS. So you're exactly... Um, talking about the, the point. For a department requiring helicopter service, they can hire a smaller helicopter. Macau is an example, and there are other helicopter uh, service companies in Hong Kong with l much lower cost than the figures quoted. So that's one comment. As for the other point, I think uh, I'll save most of the questions for part three. So, Chairman, for the time being, I have no more questions on part two. Mr. Chen, well, for JP visits or other passenger flights, well, they may be taking the flight just uh, for the for trivial purposes. So um, it may ha uh, you you mentioned that uh, it's for training. Because they need to accumulate fifteen hundred hours, 
So even if the purpose is uh, quite uh, trivial, you still need to uh, give um, take these passengers on board for training purpose. Yeah, uh, exactly. For the, the uh, fifteen hundred hours, even if we don't provide any service, we need to provide training anyway. So from another perspective. Uh, this is the necessary cost. So from another perspective, I can say that there is no cost implication. We have three members here only, so please uh, stay here. But let's have a 15-minute break. And please come back because we have no other members here. Thank you.